Welcome to episode 235 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agents Kathy Canning Mello and Jim Beasley, former FBI profilers assigned to the Behavioral Analysis Unit, BAU, and Quantico, Virginia. They review the false allegation case wherein Melissa Duckett, a young single mother, claimed a stranger had entered the bedroom of her two-year-old son, Trenton, via a ripped window screen and abducted him. On August 29, 2006, Kathy and Jim, as representatives of BAU-3, were deployed to Leesburg, Florida, to assist members of the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment CARD team, who had responded to the alleged kidnapping and investigation. The purpose of the BAU's assistance was to conduct a comprehensive behavioral assessment of Trenton's mother, Melinda Duckett focusing specifically on her personality and behavior, as well as to evaluate the interpersonal dynamics associated with the extended circle of family and associates and their possible relationship to the victim's disappearance. After appearing on a national TV news talk show, Melinda committed suicide. Trenton was never recovered. You can read longer bios for Kathy and Jim at jerrywilliams.com. There's a link for the show notes in your podcast app's description of this episode. But here's what you need to know about them now to appreciate their case review. Retired agent Kathleen Canning Mello served in the FBI for 31 years. During her 10-year assignment with the FBI's renowned Behavioral Analysis Unit, BAU, she consulted and taught thousands of criminal justice professionals domestically and internationally on crimes against children investigations. The results of her research projects on false allegations of child abduction and maternal neonaticide were published in peer-reviewed journals, educating investigators and prosecutors worldwide. Kathy also testified as an expert witness in state and federal hearings involving online crimes against children. In the latter half of her career, Kathy served as a legal attache representing the FBI overseas in Canada and the Republic of Georgia and as a unit chief at FBI headquarters. Her post-retirement career is as a part-time college instructor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Retired agent Jim Beasley served in the FBI for over 30 years. For the latter part of his career, Jim was assigned to the National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime in their Behavioral Analysis Unit, again, BAU. Jim's duties included behavioral and threat assessments of offenses and offenders in violent crimes and cyber investigations particularly those involving crimes against children, serial murder, serial rape, and online criminal activities. He also conducted research and published articles on those topics based on his interviews with dozens of incarcerated offenders, along with extensive analysis of their backgrounds as revealed in relevant case materials and treatment records. Jim is currently the president of Trident Behavioral Analysis Consulting, where he provides expert assistance and training in violent crime matters for law enforcement agencies, businesses, and nonprofit organizations. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, where he teaches a course in behavioral criminology. I also spoke to Kathy and Jim about their assessment interview of serial killer Gary Ray Bowles. But instead of making this a super long two hour plus show, I split them into two separate episodes. Both episodes are available now. But before we get to the interview, I want to remind Reader Team members that they are invited to a special book event with Kathy Sturman, From episode 233, she's the author of It's Not About the Gun, 
Lessons from My Global Career as a Female FBI Agent. The Zoom meetup is scheduled for Wednesday, July 7th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll send everyone a friendly reminder with the Zoom link on Tuesday, June 6th, and I'll put a reminder in the July Reader Team email, which is going out on Friday, July 2nd. I'll be reviewing for FBI Accuracy, a little-known movie, at least to me, starring and directed by Clint Eastwood called Bloodwork, where he plays a, you guessed it, FBI profiler. Now, if these emails don't appear in your inbox when anticipated, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and or your promo tab. And you might want to consider adding me to your email contacts and address book so that doesn't happen anymore. If you're not yet a member, there is an easy link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Kathy Canning Mello and Jim Beasley. Hi, how are you today? Great. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing fantastic. And Jim? I'm good. Thanks. Kathy, in the last episode, you and Jim talked about the Behavioral Analysis Unit, BAU, and Jim presented a case review on Gary Ray Bowles, a serial killer who targeted gay men. We're ready for your case review. This is going to be a difficult one for for me to listen to because my grandsons are around the same age as the little boy who was the victim in this case. But I think it's important to talk about because this is a strange phenomena for most parents to understand how someone could be involved in the murder of their own child. So why don't you introduce the the subject? So I'm going to be talking, and Jim as well, because Jim and I deployed to the scene after the alleged abduction of Trenton Duckett, who was two years old at the time. And he lived uh, in Leesburg, Florida. So I, I should talk about the BAU's involvement with the child abduction rapid deployment teams. So the FBI's child abduction rapid deployment teams were developed, I think, Jim, it was probably around 2003 or so, maybe two, yeah. maybe a little later. Sounds about right. So the, the idea behind developing these regional teams of FBI investigators was to make sure we had these teams that were located throughout the United States that could deploy immediately to an incidence of an of alleged abduction or missing child investigation. And the members of the teams were, were very experienced FBI agents who had a lot of experience working crimes against children cases and violent crimes cases. So they were very experienced and selected to be part of the teams based on their experience. So when there was an alleged missing child case that was that involved the FBI and typically that would happen when a local chief of police or a sheriff had this type of case and was really overwhelmed these cases involve a lot of personnel and a lot of resources as you can imagine when there's a missing child there's just a lot of effort devoted towards finding this child and solving the case quickly but that can overwhelm police departments and sheriff departments. So they oftentimes reach out to the FBI's special agent in charge in the, in that territory in order to request assistance. And of course, the SACs immediately agree and then they devote agents. And typically they will call the behavioral analysis unit knowing that these child abduction rapid deployment teams could be an, an assistant, sort of a force multiplier, right? So that occurred in this case. When there was the, you know, alleged abduction of Trenton that occurred, the FBI was called in. And so the child abduction rapid deployment team was deployed to Leesburg. And once that happens, the behavioral analysis unit assists these teams. So typically there'd be two agents that it being Jim and, and myself in this case to help the teams just coordinate with the other investigators at the the task force typically there's a, a or command post that is set up and our our assistance typically would be to help with the victimology as as Jim was talking about 
as well as to help with searches, help with media strategies, which is often very, very critical in these cases, help with the searches, help with neighborhood canvases. And because we have so much experience work in these cases day to day, right, especially when our units were created around a specific crime problem, that being crimes against children. So on a day-to-day basis, we would be consulting on missing child cases, oftentimes cold cases. We would be doing our own research relative to child abductions and missing children, as well as teaching. We did a lot of teaching in the unit, instructing investigators nationally and internationally. So having all of that experience helps us to, you know, develop our expertise to the point where we can go to these scenes and we can help the, the local investigators and the FBI sort of try to make the right decisions, you know, and, and try to lend our experience and saying, look, this, this looks to be, you know, a missing child case, or it looks to be that maybe it's a non-family abduction, or it looks like maybe the family's involved in this. And, and that's based our, on our work when we get to the ground. And at that time, we had SSA Phil Coughlin and out of Columbia and Mike McLean out of Knoxville and John Kufta out of Fort Myers. Those were the other agents that were helping us on the, the card deployment. So we all arrive at the scene and we're ready to, to dig in. And, and these cases, like I said, are just very manpower intensive and everybody is looking towards an early resolution. So people are, are just working a lot of hours. Many people, you have to actually tell them, Hey, it's time for you to go home and get a rest. But because we're dealing with missing children, everybody's invested and we want to, want to see hopefully, you know, a positive resolution to these cases. But, you know, sometimes that just doesn't happen. Some, and, and this is a case, unfortunately, where we didn't get the resolution that we would have hoped. Let me ask you your initial thoughts when you heard about the situation. A lot of times, because I had the luxury of, you know, sitting in my home, being an armchair FBI profiler, and I can say, oh, no, that didn't happen. That child wasn't abducted. <laughs> you know, I, I can do that. But I would imagine that it's human nature for even somebody trained like you and Jim to initially start to wonder, wait a minute, there may be more to this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's very much what happened in this case. And I also should mention that during this time, as I'd mentioned, and Jim mentioned, we were conducting research. He did a lot of research and child abductions and produced many peer-reviewed articles about our research in the unit on child abductions and child homicides. And during that time, I was conducting some research with Mark Hiltz, another agent in the unit, and Yvonne Murhead, who was one of our statisticians, looking at the phenomenon of false allegations of child abduction, wherein you would have a parent or a caregiver claim that that child has gone missing or has been abducted in an effort to cover up a homicide. Now, this kind of phenomenon, this kind of crime problem doesn't happen a lot, but I would say we, we saw on an average, Jim, maybe one or two cases a year. And during that time, as I mentioned, we were conducting research and we were collecting a lot of these cases and, and kind of assessing them. And we had our own coding sheet to try to look at the specific dynamics of these false allegation cases in an effort to see if we could come up with some good tips for investigators. And we ended up publishing our research on false allegations of child abduction in the Journal of Forensic Science in 2011. So this was 2006 when this event happened, August 27th of 2006. So we in the unit and my other colleagues were were in the midst of of working on this false allegation project. So I'm not sure if if that was a reason why I was deployed on this case or if it just came up in the rotation because we we had schedules for our deployments. But immediately because of the circumstances and the allegations of what happened and the time period and the timeline and, and the things that we had understood immediately were on the ground. We and the, the fact that Trenton was just two years old really led us in the direction of Melinda Duckett, the mother of of Trenton, early on in this investigation. As did the police when they heard about 
what happened and, and were given the accounts, according to Melinda. The date of occurrence happened on August 27th, which is a Sunday. And Melinda at the time, according to, to her accounts to police, she had two friends over that evening and they were watching a movie. And she had already put down Trenton at about 6.45 p.m. that evening. So when her friends show up, they didn't see Trenton. She had told them that she had put, put him down for the evening. Now, this is a very, very small apartment. I would say, Jim, probably no more than maybe 500 square feet. It's a, it was a pretty small apartment that consisted of this little, you know, common living area with an adjacent small kitchen and then two bedrooms and a bathroom. So Trenton's bedroom was, I would say, no more than 20 feet from where she would have been sitting with her two friends uh, watching the movie. So in her account, they started watching a movie. They finished the first movie and it was about 9 p.m. And she decided she was going to go check on, on Trenton. So she goes into Trenton's bedroom. And again, it's, it's adjacent to where the living room area is. And she immediately recognizes that Trenton's not in his little bed, that there's a picture frame that had fallen on the floor. And she said that she had checked around the room, a very small room in his little closet underneath the bed, didn't find him and, and looked outside and noticed that the screen to his, his window had been cut and it was about 10 inches. So immediately she calls the alarms and she tells her friends, where's Trenton? And they look around and then she tells one of her friends to call the police while she goes around the apartment complex and she ends up telling another person who, who happens to be a detective that lives in that complex what happened. He tells her, hey, you make sure you call 911. You need to get the police involved. And that's, that's kind of a, a pretty interesting dynamic to the story. And I'll, I'll go into that later when I talk about my research and false allegations. So the police show up and they, they take her, her account. And then, you know, immediately the car uh, team is deployed or, you know, within 24 hours, we were on the ground there sort of assessing what happened. And that included doing neighborhood investigations, you know, neighborhood canvases, uh, searches around the area, as well as interviews of, of Melinda, interviews of Melinda's husband, Josh. And we recognized very early on that there was a very tumultual relationship between she and, and Josh, the biological father. I was wondering what the size of the police department was in this particular town, because we need to, to stress that there are some police departments that are large enough that some of the activity that the CART team has come in to do, they can do themselves. But it sounds like uh, you were definitely need it to augment, you know, what that Yeah, I, it was a smaller department. I don't, I don't, to this day, I don't know how many investigators, but they, they had a team of investigators early on. But I think recognizing the signs of this, they knew that they were going to, to need some help because Trenton wasn't immediately found in their initial searches around the area. I talked about what our responsibility was with as being members of the BAU were deployed to these scenes. We, we look at the victimology, right? So here we have a two-year-old that has allegedly been taken out of his apartment. So looking at the crime scene, the window was front facing. So a very, again, a very small apartment. If you're looking at the front door, the window of Trent's bedroom would be just to the right of the front door. So. Melinda is alleging that someone actually cut the screen, which in this you know, front facing the apartment. So it's facing the street at 9 p.m. So I think the darkness set in at about 8 p.m. So whether or not it was completely dark or not, it was probably, you know, getting there. But it was a fairly busy apartment complex. So that would have been extremely high risk if you're, if you're considering a non-family abduction. Someone would have had to, number one, know that that was the bedroom that belonged to Trent, right? So that sort of insinuates that the person would have been inside her house at some point. So all of these, you know, considerations we're thinking of while we're, we're on the scene. And so, you know, w whether this 
person, you know, would have reached in. The screen was cut to, wasn't big enough for a person to actually crawl in. It would have been much larger if that was the case, if you had an adult crawling into the apartment. So then you're supposing that the person knew that Trenton's bed was there or called him over and had him reach up, you know, so that the person could actually grab onto him and pull him through the screen. So all of these things seemed very, you know, number one, out of the ordinary, but extremely high risk and just not probable, given the circumstances that we were looking at at that point. We look, based on all of our experience and research in these cases, what typically happens to a two-year-old, right? So as a grandparent, Jerry, you know, two-year-olds, they, they're very rambunctious, right? They can be running around, and you have to make sure that the doors are locked, that they don't get outside, they don't know where they're going to go when they go outside. And so that's a possibility with a two-year-old, that he may have just left the apartment somehow. But, you know, given Melinda's account, she said she put him down to bed. So she would have seen him leave the apartment. He was too small to actually crawl out of the window himself. So that wouldn't have happened. So then you're looking at, do non-family abductions happen to two-year-olds? Very, very rare. You know, oftentimes when we have non-family abductions, they're sexually motivated. They abduct their victims. And Jim and I have done a lot of research on those cases. Typically, your victim's going to be a female, oftentimes preteen or teenagers, although we have worked cases in the BAU where we have male victims of sexually motivated abductions, but typically they're older, right? So you have those incidents or you have maternal desire cases, right? Where you have a woman who wants to have a baby, an infant, because she has been telling others that she's pregnant and she's been anticipating this this baby and for oftentimes it's in an effort to you know be close to a lover or sometimes they are just not able to have a child and they want a child of their own so they abduct a child from a home and it's it would be an infant child so that they could pass off as their own infant right and seeing that that Trenton was two years old, that wasn't a consideration and that it would have been a maternal desire kind of uh, motivation here. So what you're left with then is to look at the victim's family. What's going on? Because we in, in every day in our country, we have parents who kill their children, right? We have child abuse that is a very, very big problem. Domestic violence and child abuse in, in our country happens on, a, on an hourly basis. So that we started to focus on immediately, especially given the contentious relationship between she and Trent. What are Melinda's personality characteristics? What are her behavioral characteristics? What's going on with her psychologically, emotionally? What's happening with her at this point in her life that she perhaps was the person who was responsible for Trenton's gone missing? So we immediately, within the first few hours of understanding what was going on and, and discounting those other options, we started to look really, really closely at Melinda Duckett. And we, we learned some things. We found through our, our research uh, into Melinda's background that she's a 21-year-old Korean-American female. So she was born in South Korea, but she moved to the United States when she was just a few months old and she was adopted by a couple that lived in New York. And she remained with this couple until she was about 17. And according to our reports and research, there were some behavioral issues with Melinda when she was young, acting out against her adoptive parents that caused her to want to live with her, with her adoptive grandparents. I believe this was, you know, from, from what we understood, sort of a, a collective decision that this was a, a good thing. And her adoptive grandparents who lived in the villages down in Florida decided to take Melinda to Florida and for her to live with them. And she did so. And she went to school, high school. That's where she met Josh. She became pregnant when she was about 18, I guess it was, and then had Trenton shortly after she graduated from high school. So very young mother with some emotional issues. And those manifested throughout their relationship. It was a short-lived marriage. They got married shortly after. There was a lot of conflict, a lot of allegations of abuse on Melinda's part by Josh. 
to the point where Melinda was what they call Baker acted. So she was involuntarily committed to a psychiatric institution in Florida because of Josh's allegations that she threatened to harm Trenton. So it became that serious to the point where she was involuntarily committed. So she was evaluated. And during that evaluation, she was diagnosed as having obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which really, I think, speaks to a lot of her behaviors and the way she presents herself to other people. And it lends itself to her being responsible for Trenton missing. And, you know, given our experience in these cases, this seemed to line up with what happened and and her allegation of Trenton going missing. So knowing all that, we sat down with Melinda on a couple of occasions. Well, well, the first thing we did was, and typically we do in these cases, while we're doing the neighborhood investigations and searches, we asked the person who last saw the victim to write up a narrative, right? A timeline, if you will. So what did you do when you got up this morning or what happened last night, depending on the circumstances and events? Write down for us in your own words, doesn't matter how long, you know, you can cross out as many times as you want. The events that happened in this case, you know, when you went to bed last night, and then all the way up, all of the events that happened. So wherever you went, whomever you talked to, whether it be in person or on the telephone, all of the events that happened throughout the previous hours that happened leading up to the time when Trenton went missing. In a normal criminal investigation, you do that to kind of lock somebody in. But I would imagine in a behavioral analysis situation, there's another purpose? Yes. Well, that that in and of itself is as well as why it's valuable because you have that person locked into that statement. But especially in this case, we needed to try to get from her some understanding of her story as to where she was during the previous hours in order to try to corroborate that, right? In in terms of collecting maybe CCTV or witness accounts of where she claimed she was during the time when Trenton was still alive. So after having her initial statement, her written statement, Jim and I sat down with her and we were kind of going through her accounts. And she said that the previous night she was at her, you know, her adoptive grandparents' house, and that information was corroborated. The adoptive grandparents said, yes, they came over the previous day on, on Saturday during the day, enjoyed the visit, had some dinner, and then they left around dinner time that evening. And then she said, you know, she went home, they went to bed, woke up the next day, and then she took Trenton to the mall and took him to the bank. And there were several other places that she claimed that she went during the day. And then she came home in the afternoon and they, she fed him dinner and then put him down before her two friends had shown up. So, we, you know, in discussing, again, we're trying to develop rapport with Melinda and she's, she's behaving very sort of emotionally and very, uh, very much like I remember this to this day, sort of like a caged lion. Like she was constantly walking back and forth very quickly and, and trying to maintain control of the situation. You know, obsessive, obsessive compulsive folks, especially the personality disordered, they're very focused on perfection, right? They have a need to control their environment, very rigid in their beliefs, very stubborn in their their beliefs. They have a, a very strict need for order. So when you're thinking about a parent who is a young parent, right? She's 21 years old and she has this need for perfection. She's caring for a two-year-old child. And, and you know, Jerry and, and Jim and myself being parents, two-year-olds can be very hard to control, right? And that's what oftentimes we see in these false allegation cases is that toddlers become very difficult for parents, especially parents who don't have the skills in, in parenting. And oftentimes, if they have difficulty managing their anger, bad things can happen, whether it be in an instance uh, or a situation where you have chronic abuse, the child is chronically abused. And we have some allegations of Joshua, biological father, that there were previous threats that Melinda had been abusing Trenton, which was, you know, ultimately what got her Baker acted. 
or you have a, a situation where it, it's just an explosive situation where the parent loses control and the child ends up dying as a result of this, you know, fatal child abuse event. So either one of those things possibly could have happened. Oftentimes in my research, there are, are no witnesses, which makes it more difficult to try to solve these crimes. Or, or sometimes there's a a sibling that witnesses the event, but oftentimes those siblings aren't verbal yet so that they can't talk about what happened. So these are the challenges of what we typically see in false allegation cases. We also see in this case staging, right? So staging is when an offender sort of manipulates the crime scene in a way to sort of detract away from from their attention. So in her efforts to make it look like a child abduction, she, you know, did some preliminary efforts of putting the photograph on the ground, the, the picture frame, and then actually cutting the screen. So whether she had done that before the friend showed up or during the time, I, I don't know. I'm assuming that probably was done before her friend showed up. So you have that staging aspect in oftentimes in false allegation cases because, you know, obviously her allegation is that someone abducted Trenton from, from the bedroom. So we're looking at those aspects as well. So in confronting Melinda, we said, hey, let, like, let's all get in a car and we'll retrace your steps during the day to sort of figure out what happened. And maybe we can go into the shops that you went into or go to the bank because we knew that there would be CCTV recordings in those places, but she refused to do that with us. So that was, you know, alarming and concerning. And it, her behavior was not in line with parents who are victims of, you know, non-family abductions because typically they'll do everything they can, everything within their control to try to help the investigators, especially early on when they know oftentimes if it's an unwitness event that the police are going to be focusing on them. So they're going to do everything they can to say, hey, get off me and my family and, and go look for the people who are responsible or the person who's responsible for this abduction. So all her behaviors certainly were leading us as well in that direction, in, in, in addition to the staging and the report of, of what happened. The CAR team is helping at this point. You know, we're, we're interviewing folks. We interviewed Josh. We interviewed grandparents that were living in in Florida at the time and just you know trying to help the police do the searches as well but we're not coming up with Tr Trenton and I failed to mention when I talked about you know motivations for kidnapping you also have ransom kidnappings which are very very rare and you can discount that immediately as well because there was no ransom demand made in this case as well so you know we're focused on Melinda and we're asking her at this point to take a polygraph, right? Shortly after this happened, she en ended up obtaining a lawyer and she claimed that her lawyer told her not to take a polygraph. Well, Josh, her the biological father, did take a polygraph. And according to the investigators, he had no problems with that polygraph. So there was no sign of deception when he took the polygraph. So in my research of false allegations, polygraphs are oftentimes the tipping points in these investigations, right? Because a parent, like I just mentioned, a parent of a, a non-family abduction of their child is is going to take a polygraph. That, you know, they're going to help investigators. They're going to do whatever they can to help. And also another issue in this case, we were doing trash recoveries and, and the police were doing trash recoveries of Melinda right after this happened. So the day after, because obviously she was a, the primary suspect in this in this alleged missing child case. So we were looking at our trash and we found the sonogram photographs as well as greeting cards from when she had had Trenton. She gave birth to Trenton. There was a travel crib. There was clothing of, of Trenton's that we found in the trash. Now, that behavior is completely out of the ordinary if you're dealing with a parent of a non-family abduction, right? Because they want to hold on to those things. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, hold on to that hope that their, their child will be recovered. And Jim and I have talked with many, many parents of non-family abductor, abductors, you know, legitimate non-family abductions. And, you know, they never move, right? They don't want to move. They don't want to change their telephone numbers. They want to keep their, oftentimes their rooms are enshrined, right? Because they want to hold out hope that if that child's ever been recovered, that the child will know where their parents are living. They want to go home 
and they want to keep everything they have preserved so that that child will know all of their toys and, and welcome back home and everything will be like it was before they were abducted. So all of her behaviors led her to be the primary or suspect in, in this case. Yeah, I, I can't imagine, you know, throwing away keepsakes like that within hours of your child going missing. If I could just interject, and I'm, I'm sure Kathy will elaborate on this as well. The idea of, first of all, in a typical case, if, if there is such a thing, we from the BAU would not necessarily get this close in interactions with a family member. In this case, it was extremely helpful because we were able to see things that we knew about from other cases like this. And that's this issue of impression management, where the parent is do, is desperate to represent themselves in the best possible light. And so in this case, all of those efforts, first of all, just kind of had the ring of being not very sincere. And then when you couple it with these other issues that Kathy just raised about the, the toys and the things found in the trash, those two things are so out of sync. And it, it's hard not to go in the direction of saying, my gosh, this woman had something to do with this disappearance. Well, Jim, you bring up a good point that I'd like to ask about, and that is a distinction between what the case agent, the agent on site who has been assigned this investigation to assist the locals, and you guys coming in as consultants. What's the difference in your responsibilities? I think, in, again, I think Kathy will have her opinion as well. I don't know that we necessarily want to try to disrupt the thinking that's going on, but to offer all of the alternatives that are possible. And, and certainly, even in this case, as strongly as we had come to believe that Melinda Duckett was responsible here, you know, we had to keep other options open as well. I mean, none of this was absolutely certain. It was simply a matter of what is her behavior telling us? How is she representing things? And and to be fair to the investigators in this case, I think they were in line with that as well. I don't recall, Kathy, maybe you do, any any disagreement on that basis, uh, on that issue in this particular case. No, I think with, with everything that was taken in, in context, I think everybody was thinking that certainly Melinda was involved. However, like you said, and we often, always in these cases, we often have parallel investigations where we're looking at the family as well as looking at the, a non-family abduction scenario. So we're working with the case agent as well as the, sometimes with the special agent in charge, whoever the media spokesman is, in order to come up with media strategies, right? In order to make sure that Trenton's photograph was disseminated immediately to the media, any kind of video that might be available through the family to sort of personalize this case so that people watching the news were like, oh my gosh, this beautiful little boy has been taken or is missing. I need to get involved. I need to try to find this person or I need to recollect where I was during that day to, to see if maybe I was in the same place that they were to generate the public's interest in, in this case. Well, I would imagine that there are different scenarios where sometimes as a person coming from, you know, the, the CARD team or BAU, you are finding out information about the case from the case agent, from the investigators, and consulting with them. And then some situations where you are actually inserting yourself and questioning the subjects. And so in this particular instance, you were having direct contact with Melinda? Yes. And, and as Jim said, this is sort of unusual that we would be speaking directly to the, the suspect in the missing child investigation. But as, as it turned out, we were spending a lot of time around her apartment trying to get a visual representation. How could this have happened? Where could the child have gone? Where could the child be right now if the child was killed? Where would the logical places be for Melinda to have disposed of his body? But as is oftentimes the case in these false allegation investigations, it's, it's a challenge for law enforcement because the suspect, in this case Melinda, she orchestrates the timeline, right? So she had many hours to have the fatal incident is what we expect happened 
And then the time to cover up what had happened if the incident happened at home, which was probably the case. So she's able to clean up and she did a lot of cleaning up that week as well. And then actually dispose of the body. So she could have driven for miles and miles on Sunday to dispose of Trent's remains. In my research, we have a portion of cases where the suspects go many, many more than 10 miles to dispose of the child because they know if that child is recovered, that that's more evidence that they were involved. So those are the challenges that we were seeing in, in these cases as well. I do remember having a conversation with her about Trenton being a toddler and and sort of commiserating with her that the terrible twos and potty training can oftentimes be vexing for parents. And I asked her specifically because we've seen in our false allegation cases that potty training can oftentimes be a trigger for parents who lack coping skills. And I asked her specifically if Trenton was potty trained, and she said he was currently being trained. And I said, how is that going? And she looked directly at me and said, it's not going well. You know, another sort of red flag. You were mentioning that one of the things that you were doing was also helping the office management present this case to the public and the media. And having been a FBI spokesperson, I know That's that- That's right. Yes. I know that sometimes the media is doing their own quote unquote investigation at the same time as law enforcement is trying to do theirs. And in this particular case, while all this is happening, both the husband, Josh, and Melinda are invited to be on the Nancy Grace show. I know Josh is filmed and Melinda calls in. You use the words develop a rapport with Melinda. That's not exactly the way that Nancy Grace conducted (laughs) her interview. So let's talk a little bit about what that's like in this particular case and, and in other cases to have the media also trying to talk to victims, talk to witnesses at the same time. Yes, and, and that can be very complicating. Jim and I have both, you know, had that experience when we're trying to do our investigation and we have the local media, in this case, the national media, who's reaching out to the parents in order to get them to comment because, of course, you know, that leads, you know, it's all part of this emotional case that they want to represent to the public. So in that aspect, it's good because they want to generate interest, but it can be competing with law enforcement efforts in trying to get to the to the facts of the case. So the Nancy Gray Show reached out to Melinda and Josh in order to participate in this interview on her program, which was very, very popular back then. She did, a, as you remember, she did a, a lot of true crime stories on her shows and oftentimes highlighted missing persons in her television show. And Nancy was a former prosecutor before she became a TV personality. I did have a chance to to look at that video, and uh, I will include a link to it in the show notes for this episode. So Melinda agreed to participate, which for me speaks to, to her confidence, right? And the need for her to control her environment. She needed to be on that television show, and she needed to say her story about, about what happened. In my view, in Jim's view, knowing what what she was responsible for, this took an incredible level of confidence and I would even say narcissism to the degree that she was going to be on national TV answering questions about what happened to her son. Very pointed questions. Plus, you would think that she knew of Nancy's hard-hitting investigative style and that she would shy away from that, too. Exactly. She was she was certainly confident enough and compulsive enough to need to be on that television show, especially, I think, knowing that Josh was going to be on the show. She needed to have her side of the story told as well. So it was it was an interesting program in that it was it wasn't just Nancy Grace. Nancy Grace had sort of a panel of experts and victim parents, right? So Mark Class, who is the father of Polly Class, who was a child who was abducted from her home by a convicted sex offender and murdered years before, 
He was on the show as well as Mark Lunsford, also a parent of a child, Jessica Lunsford, who was abducted out of her home. Both of those girls were, were preteen age when they were abducted out of their homes by offenders who were convicted later of their abductions and homicides and the motivations for those home invasion abductions was, was sexual. I have interviewed the case agent, a two-part episode on the polyclass abduction. Those who are interested in listening to that, I will put a link to that episode in the show notes for this episode. Excellent. That would be, uh, I think, a great podcast to listen to where you would get some insight and information as to what actually happens in a true non-family abduction case, as opposed to what was here was an alleged non-family abduction case. Additionally, there was a person from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on the program, and there was a retired detective. So it was quite a large panel, in addition to Josh and Melinda, to discuss the case. And I think originally, you know, they, they took Josh's story and then they asked Melinda some questions. And I felt like the panel members, including Nancy, were pretty sympathetic, I would say, at the beginning. They were trying to be understanding and sort of ask some, some very logical question, you know, about where she was during the day and what happened and, and about Trenton and what he was wearing when he went missing, and, you know, the fact that she had put him down to sleep and then all of the information about the abduction. As the, the time progressed, Nancy was asking Josh questions and Josh was answering the questions about his assistance to the police, the fact that he took the polygraph and passed it. And then it seemed logical for her to ask Melinda those same questions, you know, have you been helping police? And and then she asked her specifically where she was during the day on Sunday. And she said, you know, why aren't you helping the police going back into those shops to see if maybe there are witnesses, you know, perhaps, and she actually gave her an out at that point, perhaps there was someone who was following you that could have been responsible for his abduction. He could have followed you home and, you know, invaded your home. And abducted Trenton, but she, you know, she didn't go there. She just said no. And then she started to deflect, right? She started to deflect towards Josh. She said something like, I'm not posting myself outside the police department's door. And then she started to deflect saying that the local police and the FBI weren't on the same page, which was not true at all. Everybody was working as well as the the case agent from the local FBI office. Everybody was working together with the searches, with the interviews, with the neighborhood canvases. And again, like I had mentioned, you know, we we show up to these command posts and everybody is working together. All of the egos are put at the door because everybody wants a quick and and hopefully a happy resolution to these cases. As the program progressed, I think Nancy was getting frustrated with Melinda's answers because she wasn't being as helpful as Josh was. And the other panel members were starting to sort of poke holes and and create doubt around her story. That The one particular detective said that he out and out just did not believe that that happened in the way that she claimed it happened. So it really became sort of aggressive. And Melinda was holding up okay, but then when... When Nancy Grace asked her specifically about why aren't you helping the police? Why don't you take a polygraph? And the last comment that she made, she sounded very sort of quiet and and sort of weak. Strong contradiction to how she was behaving when she first started out in the program. And she said, because I was told not to. And then that was, those were her last words on that program. And then Following that program, within the next few hours, she drove to her adoptive grandparents' home in the villages. They weren't home at the time, but she went in and she found her grandfather's shotgun and she blew her head off with, with the shotgun. Very violent end to the story. Before then, she had actually wrote some uh, several suicide notes that were later published by the media. And again, not accepting any responsibility other than to say in one of the notes that she would not have been a good mother, but she blamed the the media and uh, that, you know, they were uh, too aggressive with her and they weren't uh, spending their time looking for Trenton, that they were focusing all their efforts on, you know, persecuting Melinda. I would imagine that 
the way that you would handle a suspect, especially if your goal is to find the victim, you know, to find the child, is that you don't confront them as aggressively as the grilling that she got on the show. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think what we all were human beings, right? And we fall back to what's comfortable, what we're comfortable with. And Nancy Grace was comfortable, obviously, with her prosecutorial role before she became a TV personality. So I think she just immediately, given the facts and circumstances and the fact that Melinda was, she knew, was not being truthful, that she just defaulted into this prosecutorial road and, and started to go at her with some pretty hard questions. But it wasn't only Nancy. The other members of, like I said, the retired detective who were, was cast in doubt on her story. Actually, the Nick Mac person, the National Center for Missing and Children, also expressed doubt as to the facts as Melinda was conveying them. So I think Melinda at, at that point felt what we call a narcissistic injury happened. She thought it was going to go a lot better than what, you know, it turned out to be. And she couldn't recover from that injury because she was on national television. So how do you recover from that? In her own mind, there was no way that she could, and it, which, you know, ended up causing her to kill herself in the end. It's a very tragic ending because, number one, the fact that she decided that it was her only recourse to, to kill herself, that is tragic in and of itself. But the fact that Trenton has never been found, in our view, and Jim can also share his, his thoughts on this, you know, this many years later, you know, you're dealing with a body disposal, in our opinion, that happened in August in Florida, where there are, you know, many bodies of water, and, and oftentimes women choose to use water burials that would not have been out of the ordinary. And, and to have his remains recovered this many years later, it, it seems very unlikely. So just one of those cases that, you know, we, we never really have a, a resolution. I feel for the family members, you know, I know recently that Melinda's grandparents there in Florida came out saying that they still don't believe that Melinda was responsible. And of course, you know, family members are not going to want to believe that a family member is responsible for this horrific crime to people that they love very dearly. So you certainly can empathize with them and in what they're feeling. But I just think due to all of our experience working these cases and my specific experience working false allegations and research and false allegation cases that all of the evidence and facts and circumstances in our, our personal involvement in this case leads us to believe that Melinda was responsible for Trenton's homicide and his disappearance. True crime right now is so popular. It's popular on podcasts, it's popular on TV, it's popular in books. When it comes to active investigations are cold cases where now you have so many people, journalists and just individual armchair detectives looking at cases. Do you have any thoughts about that popularity and what it will mean to what you do as a profession? I have mixed feelings uh, about that. On the one hand, I think if you're in law enforcement, you can't have it both ways because your media person or your chief of police or whoever is always out there, you know, asking for the public's help and support and tips and everything else. And if some of those people end up going farther than investigators might prefer, it can come off as being a little bit disingenuous. So I think there's kind of a fine line there. My personal feeling, if I could if, if I were in charge, would be to try to address that head on and, and seek the public's assistance, but do it in such a way that it's considered collaborative so that people are not insulted or rejected just because they come up with some theory that investigators may not want to hear or they don't think is worthy of, of being pursued. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. I mean, you do want the public's help can the public sometimes get in the way? Sure, they can. And sometimes that can create chaos within an investigation. But it comes off as, as very negative. Law enforcement says, well, we want your help, but only on our terms. And so I, I'm not sure how to address that in a perfect way, but those are my thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree, Jim. 
And I think, you know, there's always going to be interest in, in true crime. And I think having the internet now and, and social media and all of these true crime series now that are available, you know, podcasts and movies and television shows, they've been very popular over the years. So you're going to have that sustained interest. To some degree, I think it's, it's good. It's natural that people are involved or want to be involved in these cases to the degree that they can. Because they're fascinating, right? They speak to the darkness in, in humanity. So there's always going to be sort of an interest in the darkness of our, our personalities. With all the cases that we worked in the unit, I can't remember one where we can say definitively that, you know, maybe a private investigator's interests or a member of the public had interfered in, in any way. I think it's just, it's something that is usually managed at the local level. But it can have, I think, pretty good outcomes, right? I think if you, if you think about that case, that Golden State Killer case that Michelle McNamara that wrote the book, I'll Be Going in the Dark, you know, she did a lot of work in the DNA databases that I think helped the police ultimately find the Golden State Killer. So I think, you know, it, it has potential good outcomes as well. That's just my point. And I think in that case, I, I, I'm going to try to delve into things I don't know anything about, but it seems like from outside that investigation, a certain amount of, of finesse or restraint or whatever was involved. Frankly, it seems like her involvement in and her, her intense motivation to help the police was, seems like it was welcome. Again, I think any, any situation can go south, but I think for the most part, that, that that's probably the best example I, I can remember in recent memory where the public's participation went hand in hand with law enforcement and a good thing happened in terms of a solution. There's a lot of interest in younger people in these programs now, especially with the all the podcasts and Netflix movies. And that generates their interest in, hey, I want to be part of the BAU or I want to be a police officer. Or, I want to be an FBI agent. So I think all, all of that, oftentimes, of course, we know most of the time that, you know, Hollywood's depiction of reality isn't really what reality is all about. But certainly in spurning their interests, I think that that's potentially a good thing as well. Well, this is a good time then for us to talk about what it takes to get to the unit. Now, we'll go into when and why you joined the FBI in just a bit. But for both of you, Talk about what motivated you to apply to be a part of the unit, because I understand that it's extremely competitive to be selected. Yes, it is. So just you know, speaking for myself, I was an investigator for years working in Philadelphia, where I met you, Jerry. And during that time period, it was the mid-90s when Director Free was the FBI director, and he had six children of his own. And he started uh, this Crimes Against Children program in the Bureau. And it started right around the time that when the internet was a baby, I say, right? Because we're recognizing as investigators how the internet was being used to facilitate crimes. And certainly for child sex offenders, it was being used to transmit child pornography and to solicit kids interstate for sex. So it became uh, a facilitator for those involved in crime against children. So I was very interested in working crimes against children. My kids were babies during that time as well. So I started to work more of those innocent images cases that revolved around child pornography and internet solicitation. And I really became interested in working those. And then I had the opportunity to work with the Philadelphia Police Department on what turned out to be a false allegation of child abduction. A foster parent of this, this child claimed that she walked the child to the local bus stop. And then that was the last time that she had ever seen of the child. So the police were called. They did the investigation. And as it turns out, she had beaten this child to death, put her in a duffel bag and dumped her in Schuylkill River. And her remains were found shortly thereafter. So I was helping the local police department, the Philadelphia Police Department with, with that investigation until her body was recovered, and it was found to be a local homicide case. But that really sparked my interest in the BAU because I was working with them, communicating with them during those years when I was working crimes against children. And I was particularly fascinated by that phenomenon of a 
parent or caregiver claiming that their child went missing in an effort to cover up a homicide. So that that interest and fascination remained with me and sort of helped me become involved with the unit's work. And then when the, the time was right for me, I applied and was fortunate enough to be hired on. What was your story, Jim? Mine was similar, but slightly different. I was a supervisor from 92 to 99 in the Fresno Resident Agency. That's out of our Sacramento field office in California. And my closeness to most of the investigations was limited. I supervised agents who did those investigations, but there were times when my involvement was a little deeper. I had to deal with the news media or at least coordinate the news media doing interviews with my bosses up in Sacramento, which was three hours away. But during that period, mid to late 90s, we were involved in several high-profile child abduction homicide cases. I became a a little more aware of what the, the behavioral analysis unit did when they would send people out on some of these cases from time to time, not all of them. And then I think like Kathy, that just kind of led to this further interest. And then ironically, after I was selected to come to the unit and Kathy and I got there about at the same time, our office was instrumental in working the case involving Carrie Stainer, who committed a number of murders. And that was after I'd already been selected to come to the unit. I think you had Jeff Reinick on one of your episodes in the past who talked about that case. Yes, I so, did. Again, my, my perspective was different because it was from the management side. And, and so that I, I guess I came with a slightly different mindset, but, but the interest was stoked just based on the cases that we had been working. And I guess for people that are interested in you know, joining the FBI to become a member of the Behavioral Analysis Unit, what they need to get out of that is both of you were veteran agents having worked investigations and even gone into management before you could apply and be considered for the unit. Yeah, I I think my response would have to be, that's the thing that's most frequently misportrayed or overlooked in media treatments about people coming to the unit. As you mentioned, it's very competitive. Kathy and I were fortunate enough to be a part of one of the large, as far as I know, influxes of new people to come to the unit at the same time. There were, I think, about 10 or 12 of us who came in all at once. And it was during an era when that, as Kathy mentioned, the crimes against children focus was really firing up all all over the country and and especially within the Bureau. So I think that's what gets overlooked in the media treatments is that people are just plucked from the field or plucked from the FBI Academy and thrown right into this. And that is absolutely never the case in the real world. there's, I would say most people who go to the unit end up having at least 10 and more commonly toward 15 years of investigative experience elsewhere in the Bureau before they can get selected. Does that mean that as a brand new agent at the FBI Academy, you're not going to be plucked out to go after serial killers? <laughs> what? Not, not quite. <laughs> what? What are you, what are you saying? <laughs> well, I have to say from a dramatic perspective, that is a more interesting way to represent it. I, ca- I can't deny that it comes off with a more interesting spin on it. But I, I mean, and Kathy will attest to this as well. There's a whole lot about this that, I mean, within the Bureau, some, sometimes people would say, hey, I really envy you. You're fortunate to be there. You get to see and do all these things. And, and from the research side, it, it's a good example that just isn't necessarily terribly interesting. It's not like we're out doing these things day in, day out, one new case every day. I mean, it just, as Kathy mentioned, these are not very common occurrences and our involvement in them sometimes is pretty limited. But on the other hand, yeah, I do acknowledge that, that, that it's interesting. But speaking to the research aspect, my gosh, I wish to compare how the original 36 interviews of the sexual murderers and the serial murderers that were done by by the original behavioral science unit members back in the late 70s, early 80s. Back then, they they didn't have this thing from from an academic perspective that required the approval of something called an institutional review board. But now that is very common. It's mandatory that you present your project. If you're an academic, it goes to your academic superiors. Even if you're in law enforcement, you still have to deal with government entities that have to approve. 
you having contact with these people, if you're going to call it a research project. And that presents its own challenges. There's a lot of work that goes into writing up a proposal, getting it approved. How are you going to conduct the interviews? What kind of protocol you're going to use? It's that those details are kind of on the, the dry side, to be quite honest. And, and it, and it does require a lot more work that isn't terribly interesting compared to the telling of the stories of these cases. In the previous episode, Jim told us when he joined the FBI and why he joined the FBI. So we are at the point of the interview where I like to give listeners a little bit more information about my guest. So Kathy, when and why did you join the FBI? You know, we were just talking about, you know, the media's influence and now there are podcasts and Netflix and all kinds of TV shows devoted to crime, true crime and, and other types of crime. So when I was growing up, I had four brothers and myself and my family, and none of my brothers were involved in law enforcement at all. But my father and I used to watch all of the cop programs, the detective programs. So he used to like watching Columbo and Mannix in the streets of San Francisco. And my favorite was always Hawaii Five-0. I just I loved that show. So that was kind of our thing. It was a father-daughter thing. And, and he, you know, developed my interest. He always encouraged me, even though back, that was back in the seventies, right? So women didn't start becoming FBI agents until 1972. I didn't know at the time I wanted to be in the FBI, but I knew I was wanted to be in, in some area of law enforcement. And that, that never changed since I was a very young child. And then I was a police dispatcher before I became an FBI agent. So I was able to, you know, be exposed to local police work. And at the time, the chief of police of my hometown was a retired U.S. Marshal. And he was working with the marshals during, the, you know, the civil rights period and just a really cool guy worked in the uh, witness protection program as well with the marshals. So he was sort of my mentor and got me really interested in being a federal investigator. And then I, you know, went to, went to college and I was going to go to law school thinking that I would need a law degree. But someone influenced me. They said, hey, why don't you just apply? You know, you have the minimum requirements of a college degree and and work experience. So I applied and, you know, one thing led to another and I was accepted into the academy. And and the rest is history. Had a really phenomenal career, which is why I want to share it now with my students at UNCW. So that's what you're doing now in retirement? So I'm a part-time instructor at University of North Carolina at Wilmington here. I, I relocated to Wilmington with my husband from Virginia after I retired, doing some teaching in, in criminal justice and victim and offender behavior, which is a very popular course, as you would imagine, just toward a course in crime and justice issues. So I'm enjoying the interaction. I, my first semester, I was able to spend on campus, and then everything went to Zoom, of course, with the pandemic. So looking forward to the time, hopefully next September, when we can get back on campus, because I really enjoy the interactions, the positive energy that I get on campus. So looking forward to that. I like to give my guest the last word. Jim shared his thoughts in the previous episode. Kathy, what would you like to say? Yeah, like Jim, I spent more than three decades in the Bureau. And uh, it was just an amazing opportunity for, you know, a lower middle class kid from Rhode Island, publicly educated, to be able to become an FBI agent and have the opportunity to have as many adventures and work with amazing, phenomenal, wonderful people like yourself, Jerry, spending time in Canada and living in the Republic of Georgia. Those are, you know, opportunities I never would have dreamed of back when I was watching Hawaii Five-0 with my father many years ago. And I often get asked, especially now when law enforcement, the profession is seeing its challenges for better or for worse in this country. A lot of students are maybe questioning their interest in pursuing a career in criminal justice. And I always tell them it is a rewarding career. You have the opportunity to be part of something that's bigger than yourself, to make a positive impact in your community the safety of your country, or even just, you know, helping victims and pursuing justice. It's a, it's a noble cause and it's, it's a worthy cause. 
So I do my best to encourage the next generation of law enforcement leaders to get involved in law enforcement because it is a wonderful career. And that's the end of the interview. Don't forget to check out the previous episode where Kathy and Jim review their assessment interview of serial killer Gary Ray Bowles. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Kathy and Jim, a missing and exploited child flyer for Trenton Duckett, photos of Melinda Duckett and Joshua Duckett. You'll also be able to watch that episode of the Nancy Grace show where Melinda Duckett and Joshua Duckett were interviewed. You'll also find links to information about the BAU and the FBI's Critical Incident Response Group and news articles about Melinda Duckett and the abduction of Tritton. During the case review, Kathy mentioned the episode that I did about the abduction of 12-year-old Polly Class. I've included a link to the episode in the show notes, along with links to previous FBI retired case file review episodes with BAU profilers and about crimes against children. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to audio. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books in your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, A Manual for Armchair Detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, Fun for Armchair Detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler. All of my books are available wherever books are sold, as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Thank you.